Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of a two part teaching video on the social ecological systems framework developed by Elena Rostrum. Uh, this is the first of the two videos where we're going to look at what exactly is a social ecological system. My name is Harini Nagendra. I am an external affiliate of the Ostrom workshop at Indiana University and a long term workshopper. Today, we're going to uh, talk about what a social ecological system is. Now, this video is part of a series of teaching videos developed by the Ostrom workshop with the idea of communicating to people, especially students, but well beyond students, uh, who are interested in understanding the theories, methods, and approaches developed by the Bloomington School and by our colleagues at the Ostrom workshop. So the social ecological systems framework of Eleanor Ostrom has been extremely widely influential in uh, research across the world. But in this, which is the first of the two-part video series, I want us to step back and understand what is a social ecological system and why are we looking at the world this way? Of course, the idea of social ecological systems or coupled human and natural systems as they're also known is a very influential idea that's been around for a long time. And it was uh, developed by a uh, number of people at the Resilience School and the Resilience Alliance, including um, uh, Carl Folke and Fikrit Berkies and Johan Kolding and a number of others. And this was the idea that human beings are embedded in local systems and there are close interactions between the human part of the system, uh, the, that is the social part of the system and the ecological part of the system. So humans shape the ecology around them, both by uh, withdrawing different kinds of resources from them and by the management practices they have. And in turn, ecology shapes the, the mindsets, the, the spiritual associations, the ways we think, the way we behave, our well-being, And so ecology in turn shapes and influences social systems. Right? And I'd like to show you why that is with a few examples from different places around the world. And let's start with indigenous communities in any forest, for instance, the Amazon forest. It's very hard to think of an indigenous community and separate it from its forests or its ecosystems in which they live. They are so intimately part of the forest. They have their sacred gods there. They have sacred traditions of worship. They know intimately all the species in the forest, use them in many ways, their livelihoods depend on the forest. And this you can see, for instance, in uh, almost any anthropological work on longstanding indigenous tribes, wherever they look at them in any part of the world, you will not find a dissertation that does not talk about or ignores their ethnobotanical knowledge, for instance. It will, in great depth, uh, talk about how every part of their life from birth to death is associated with the nature that they see around them. Unfortunately, the same is not true for many traditional ecological or conservation biology ways of studying these forests. Historically, conservation biology has always tended to look at these kinds of systems as ecosystems and not as social ecological systems. And this has been sad because it has led to a dominant conservation approach that says that indigenous people or uh, indeed, indeed all kinds of people are harmful to the forest and you need to relocate them outside forests in order to protect these places. And therefore you find many protected areas have a simplistic view of conservation which says for conservation you need to relocate these communities. And that leads to a number of different fallouts. For instance, in the Amazon, there has been a lot of research that shows that when you look at indigenous reserves, re protected forest patches that are protected by indigenous communities, these are far more robust under conditions of all kinds of stresses from climate change to drug smuggling wars and to ethnic conflict. Right? And similar research in Nepal also shows that when you have indigenous communities that were protecting their forests, they were far more resilient to Maoist conflict in uh, the troubled times of Nepal. You know, when, when Nepal was undergoing a lot of uh, crisis during the Maoist period. And the same is true for forests in India today. For instance, uh, close to where I live in Bangalore, there is the Biligiri Rangaswamy Betta Tiger Reserve or the BR Hills Tiger Reserve. This has the Soligar tribes that are deep in the forest that have been there for generations. And they historically protected this forest and managed it through repeated small fires. So they were controlled fires and they kept in weedy, weedy species like Lantana camera in check and were able to maintain the forest in the condition that it was for a long time, which was a flourishing forest full of wildlife. 
when the government took it over and the forest department it became uh, under the indian forest department uh, it became a managed tiger reserve this idea this social ecological practice of controlled fires was banned because they believed that it was damaging to the forest and the same has been true for instance for yellowstone uh, forest in the us where native communities had a practice of controlled fire and this was banned for some time and we know what happens when you ban these kinds of controlled fires what you have is a lot of uh, woody inflammable biomass builds up and then at one shot suddenly sometime you have a spark that happens and you have a fire that goes out of control and the entire forest goes down so controlled fires are useful but more importantly indigenous communities and their practices of managing these forests kept the ecology in a particular condition and so both from the ecological standpoint and the social standpoint it's very it's really impossible to separate these two they are tightly coupled social ecological systems now you might be looking at this and thinking okay this is true of indigenous communities but this is not true of all types of habitats in the in the world and i'd like you to take, to take you to a completely different kind of a, a habitat a city and a city is also a social ecological system and this understanding of cities as social ecological systems is true of new york for instance here's a study of uh, new york done by the us parks and rec service and they look at the number of protected areas uh, around new york city and within new york city and these are some of the most intensely visited parks across the us because people who live in cities not just desire nature but they also almost need nature because they need to go and spend some time in parks for mental health for physical well-being and just to, to just re refresh themselves right and so this research was very interesting because if you manage parks purely ecologically it doesn't work because when you have human beings coming into these parks and these are very intensively visited areas their trails bring in invasive species and so parks management decide has to manage these invasive species by taking them out but what this research finds is that there are certain kinds of visitors in fact those who are not ecologically trained or knowledgeable who actually like these invasive species because they green canopy species and they make the park look more natural from their perspective so parks when managers manage them they respond to human needs of these parks and so parks in cities can also shift as social ecological systems to a different kind of ecology and this you know is not just true of a city like new york coming across the world to a very different place bangalore's lakes bangalore has a number of rainwater harvesting structures called tanks or lakes and these used to be one kind of social ecological system where there were cows grazing migrant workers people who washed their clothes were integral parts the city now considers them ecological systems only and they've dropped the idea of a social ecological system they have become places for water recharge for recreation for nature watching this is as an aside eleanor ostrom was here planting a jackfruit tree at one of these lakes in 2012 shortly before she passed away but going back to this picture of parks of these lakes with uh, grasses and cows any indian city and bangalore certainly no exception will have sewage flowing into the lakes it's impossible to manage them however well your you know underground sewage networks are and this is in fact true of any global south city cows are very essential in social ecological systems of this kind because when you have sewage entering along with the sewage comes nitrogen and phosphorus that encourages plant growth and when you have too many plants that cover the surface of this lake then they suck out all the oxygen in the lake and you that leads to wide scale fish death and not just fish death everything in the lake dies everything living in the lake dies you have complete in short ecological collapse and you do see these in water bodies across india and part of the solution certainly not the whole solution but a big part of it is to allow these lakes to thrive as the kind of social ecological systems they used to be which is with the lakes and the fishers and the women who harvest these greens that grow on the side of the lakes because this sucks out the biomass it is used in livelihoods it's used in nutrition it provides the city with organic milk and it helps to keep the lakes pure right so not understanding that these lakes are social ecological systems leads to mismanagement in a certain way which is actually harmful both to the ecology and the sociological system this is true for indigenous areas in the amazon this is true for parks and rec in new york city and this is true for lakes in bangalore okay so i hope i've shown you through these different examples why it's very important for us to understand any part of the world where humans live 
as social ecological systems. Social ecological systems can be at this scale, it could be at the broad universal scale and at all scales in between. And in the next part of this two part video, we will look at the Ostrom uh, developed social ecological systems framework and see how this is a useful analytical approach that helps us look at different kinds of social ecological systems along a comparable set of variables and understand what makes them tick, when they work well and when they don't and how we need to fix them. So I hope this has been useful for you. If you have any questions, please shoot me an email at this address, harini.nagendra.abo.edu.in. Thank you for watching.